This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Yuat. It's Friday, January 29th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of coronavirus, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate you're staying with us on Africa 54. Several parents of Somali youth recruited to work in Qatar allege instead they have been forced into military service in Eritrea. Soraya Ali has more. Khadija Ahmed thought her only son was going to work as a guard as part of Qatar's 2022 World Cup preparations. But at her home in Somalia's capital Mogadishu, she now fears the job was a trick and that the 16-year-old may have been forcibly recruited to fight for Eritrea, one of the world's most secretive nations. The boy is missing and I don't know if he's dead or alive. Their father, a senior military officer, died for his country. Other families have similar stories and the apparently secret recruitment of youths for Eritrea is stirring anger in Somalia. Last week, protests were sparked after the former deputy director of Somalia's National Intelligence Security Agency, Abdi Salam Gulid, said Somalis had been sent by Eritrea to fight in Ethiopia's northern Tigray region. I don't have an accurate number, I don't have any evidence, but I do have a reliable source who told me the number of Somali soldiers, the casualties, are about 370, and other 100 numbers of are died in, 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 in a battlefield. He provided a list of names which Reuters was unable to independently verify that he said was given to him by an Ethiopian official. <laughs> Mohamed Dahir believes his two sons may have been killed in Tigray, where Ethiopia's government has been fighting rebellious regional forces. He says he can't sleep worrying about his children and not knowing if they are dead or alive. A regional security analyst said around 1,000 Somalis had been recruited and taken to Eritrea, with some having now returned, some unreachable and others still in Eritrea, a country often referred to as the North Korea of Africa. Somalia's government did not respond to requests for comment on its apparent role in the recruitment, though spokesman Mohamed Ibrahim said no Somalis had been sent to Ethiopia. Eritrean Information Minister Yamane Meskel said the claims were ludicrous and that there is massive disinformation floating around. That was Soraya Ali of Reuters reporting. A Kenyan man who was born deaf has developed a mobile learning application for sign language to help deaf children learn online during the COVID-19 pandemic. Victoria Munga reports from Nairobi. For 13-year-old deaf student Stephanie Njeri, remote learning during the COVID-19 pandemic could have been quite difficult. But thanks to the Kenya Sign Language KSL fingerspelling application, she has been able to keep up with her studies. It is easy for me when I am doing my homework at the revision on my own. When my parents forget to think of spell, it helps to it helps to remind them. Jerry's parents help her study while the KSL finger spelling app helps them communicate. During homework sessions, you'll find that there are things she wants me to assist. But if she try to sign to me, I'm not able to comprehend exactly what she needs. So she'll open the app and she'll start showing me this is what I need. The application was developed during the pandemic by Hudson Asiema, who was himself born deaf, to help Kenya's 4,000 deaf school children with remote learning. Because we didn't have a lot of these apps that are centered for children accessible offline. When you compare the same with the hearing kids, 
Now, they have a lot of apps that they can access for them to learn easy basics of language like alphabets. The disability organization Enable helped ASIEMA develop the app. Why Enable is coming in is to help develop this app or to help you know, link up the designer or the developer with the, with, with the specialists from across, across the world so that the app is, is enabled to have more features, to be more friendly even to the, to the, to the younger ones. Deaf community leaders in Kenya say the technology has improved learning among deaf students. And it will sort of the issue of children staying at home and not learning sign language. And through this app, it's, it's something which is very technical because they'll have to use their phone. And it will be very helpful to the deaf. While the app was designed for deaf students learning at home, students are finding it useful even after returning to school this month. Victoria Amunga for VOA News, Nairobi. Newly qualified doctors are struggling to find work in South Africa despite the country's understaffed public hospitals weakening under the burden of COVID-19. David Doyle reports. COVID-19 has brought South Africa's understaffed public hospitals to breaking point. So it's not surprising that newly qualified Dr. Michelle Serfontaine thought it would be easy to find a job. She was wrong. Ten job applications have all been rejected. Nine didn't even give her an interview. We see it all over social media and on the news saying that doctors are under a huge strain currently, that they currently burdened with the overworkload that they're experiencing. Serfontaine is one of scores of junior doctors who've been unable to find placements, despite staff shortages in the midst of an outbreak that has killed more than 40,000 people, by far the highest toll in Africa. Sapide Tlali is interim chair of the Junior Doctors Association. Before the pandemic, there was a shortage of, 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 of doctors or healthcare workers in general, and now the pandemic has even made it worse. Throughout the pandemic, South African doctors and nurses have complained of understaffing and being made to work punishingly long shifts. According to Hire Our Medical Heroes, a campaign pressuring the South African government to take on more medical staff, nearly 200 doctors, 325 nurses and 200 other healthcare workers are unemployed. So having more hands on board would obviously be of a benefit to the hospital and therefore having more staff would also decrease patient waiting time and therefore increase patient care. I'm not a Department of Health spokesperson did not respond to repeated requests for comment, really? but budget constraints may explain the anomaly. Alex van den Hever, an expert in the administration of public health at the University of Witwatersrand, says the government is trying to rein in its national wage bill, adding that there's not enough flexibility in the budget to temporarily hire doctors to deal with the pandemic. David Doyle of Reuters filed that report. Africans are continuing to weigh in on what they would like to see from the administration of new U.S. President Joe Biden. Former Kenyan ambassador to the United States, Elkanah Odembo, emphasizes the importance of forging strong relations between the U.S. and the continent in the security and business arenas. I think number one is trade. Uh, trade is important because trade is also aligned with U.S. foreign policy. We have to remember the pillars of, of U.S. foreign policy around national security, U.S. national security, the security of American citizens, America as a country, and American allies. We are, as Kenya, as Africa, most of us allies of the United States. So we must align ourselves with that number one priority of the United States. The second one is around global trade. America wants global uh, resources internationally. America wants market internationally. Uh, and so we then must also position ourselves within the context of what are the United States, America's priorities with regard to uh, uh, foreign policy. And then the third one is global peace and the balance of power. Uh, how can we as a continent also contribute towards uh, uh, what America sees as, uh, as an important uh, element in global peace and, 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 and global you know, harmony and, and so forth. Uh, so there are those three are the pillars of U.S. Uh, foreign policy and to the extent that we can also align 
and show that we have something to bring to the table in terms of those agendas, uh, then I think there is uh, a, a natural uh, uh, meeting. Uh, and for me, trade uh, and, 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 uh, uh, and investment and business, I think, is, is a tremendous opportunity. Ambassador Odembo also underscores the continent's numerous opportunities for investment and economic growth, areas in which China, with its years-long partnerships with countries across Africa, has an advantage over the United States. I think uh, one of the things that uh, this uh, new administration can do uh, it, it, with regard to its uh, relationship with, with the continent is to reach out uh, and establish what the continent, especially in the, context, in the context of the continental free trade area, uh, what does Africa want to do with the world in terms of trading? What does Africa want to do with the United States? What are the opportunities that Africa presents to the United States? The United States must pay attention to what exists on this continent as opportunities for them. Uh, they have a lot of catching up to do. Uh, the Chinese, for example, uh, all over the continent investing uh, heavily, particularly uh, in infrastructure. Uh, the United States must then also decide, uh, and, and changes are already beginning to happen. We can see how the U.S. is paying much more attention now towards uh, issues of investment and trade uh, and prioritizing those uh, on the continent. You have... Uh, uh, more government support for private sector in the U.S. engagement in Africa, in big infrastructure projects, for example, uh, which wasn't there. As you know, a lot of the Chinese companies are supported heavily uh, by the state. Uh, uh, and so the United States has uh, learned that if they're going to be competitive, uh, especially on this continent, uh, here we are, a continent of 1.3 billion, mostly youthful population, with the world's largest natural resources, with the la world's largest arable land, so in terms of agriculture and the world's uh, food security issues, the United States has an opportunity to engage with this continent in a win-win arrangement. Uh, and I think uh, these four years present that opportunity. That was former Kenyan ambassador to the United States, Elkano Dembo, talking about the issues Africa wants to see from the administration of new U.S. President Joe Biden. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24 seven on voaafrica.com. Coming up, Heather Maxwell takes us to New York where three brothers perform their latest song. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Africa 54. In his first full week in office, U.S. President Joe Biden has focused on reversing multiple Trump administration policies and unveiling plans to address the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the economic, immigration, and climate change. Viewers Michelle Quinn reports on how the flurry of new policies and actions may be received by a deeply divided country. On this January day, my President Joe Biden came to office on January 20 with a message to unify the nation. With unity, we can do great things, important things. In his first full week in office, Biden, a Democrat, 
has upended many policies enacted by his Republican predecessor, Donald Trump, on energy policy, foreign policy, immigration, and other areas. Most fulfilled Biden campaign promises, but Senator Marco Rubio expressed the view shared by fellow Republicans when he criticized what he called Biden's executive fiat. We now have a president who talks like a centrist, but is governing from the far left. And we're, we're not going to be able to just sit around here in a honeymoon period and watch these things happen. Some observers say Biden's actions signal that his administration will make a hard pivot from the Trump presidency. It's a signal of really moving in a different direction than the previous administration. And obviously that's not going to come without some level of division. But also, it's, there's you know, a number of polls out that suggest that a lot of these policies are fairly popular. One example, Biden's executive order allowing transgender people to once again serve in the U.S. military. 70% of Americans supported this in a Gallup poll in 2019. Biden's call for unity and his initial policy steps, say presidential observers, mirror the approach taken by former President Barack Obama who entered office during a financial crisis. Biden confronts a different crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic, blamed for the deaths of more than 400,000 Americans and a ravaged economy. If history is a guide, Biden has a tough road ahead. You know, the Obama stuff, I, I don't think that the messaging necessarily worked all that well in terms of bringing the uh, right together with the left. And I don't think it's likely to work very well now either. Uh, but it seems to be that, you know, the, the judgment is that it's the best uh, of a, you know, tough situation in terms of unifying a nation that's pretty heavily divided right now. Biden says he supports the second impeachment trial of Trump, which is set to take place in the Senate on February 9th. The House impeached Trump alleging incitement of insurrection for his actions leading up to the January 6th assault on the U.S. Capitol. Trump has defended his actions and denounced the violence that took place that day. But Senate Democrats insist Trump must be held accountable. Biden's call for unity seeks to rally a nation over a shared set of democratic values, even as he implements sweeping policy changes that anger many Republicans. Azari sees no contradiction. The two sides are going to fight about policy, and they should. They shouldn't unite necessarily on policy. Republicans may accuse Biden of seeking to cancel his predecessor's legacy. Democrats accused Trump of the same four years ago. Michelle Quinn, VOA News. President Biden has signed a series of sweeping executive orders aiming to cut oil, gas, and coal emissions to tackle climate change. Biden says he wants the U.S. to lead the global response once again to the climate crisis, a sharp departure from his predecessor. VOA White House correspondent Patsy Widakuswara has more. 2020 was the hottest year on record following the planet's long-term warming trend according to NASA data. Aiming to cut oil, gas and coal emissions to stave off the effects of climate change, President Joe Biden said the U.S. can no longer wait to deal with the climate crisis, calling it an existential threat. And just like we need a unified national response to COVID-19, we desperately need a unified national response to the climate crisis because there is a climate crisis. We must keep, we must lead global response. On Wednesday, Biden signed executive actions on climate, including stopping new federal oil and gas leases, ending subsidies for fossil fuels, taking steps to conserve 30 percent of the country's land and water by 2030, and moving toward all electric government vehicles. These actions followed Biden's move on his first day in office to rejoin the Paris Accord, the global climate agreement President Donald Trump withdrew from in 2017. Paris alone is not enough. Uh, not when almost 90 percent of all of the planet's emissions, global emissions, come from outside of U.S. borders. We could go to zero tomorrow and the problem isn't solved. Kerry said the Biden administration will commission a national intelligence estimate on the security implications of climate change. And for the first time, climate change will be a core consideration in U.S. national security and foreign policies. The test is going to be on how he overcomes the constraints, 
how he kind of drives this agenda and, and even pushes back entrenched interests while working with those that are committed both domestically in the United States and internationally for a post-carbon world. Biden said his climate action plan will help bring economic recovery by creating jobs for workers in the declining fossil fuel industry, an idea criticized as ludicrous by the president of the West Virginia Coal Association. Why we would want to trade one job for another and go through the transition and all the costs, particularly when the end result is going to cost everybody more money. The administration's climate plan also prioritizes environmental justice by directing agencies to invest in low-income and minority communities that usually bear the brunt of natural disasters, pollution, and other impacts of climate change. Pat Sivida Kuswara, VOA News. Cicely Tyson, the pioneering black actor who gained an Oscar nomination for her role as the sharecropper's wife in Sounder, a Tony Award in 2013 at age 88 and touched the viewers' hearts in the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman has died. She was 96. A one-time model, Tyson began her screen career with the bit parts but gained fame in the early 1970s when black women were finally starting to get starring roles. Besides her Oscar nomination, she won two Emmys for playing the 10-year-old former slave in the 1974 American television drama, The Autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman. In our entertainment segment, live music is hard to find during a global pandemic, but we're in luck today because Heather Maxwell, host of Music Time in Africa, found some. She takes us to New York, where three brothers opened their rehearsal space to let us in on their newest song, Wawea Awa. <laughs> Yes, and I'm in New York still, this time though in Queens, and I'm in a church with the Nyonlofu brothers from Benin. And this is JB on the keys, and this is Samuel on drum set. He is the senior brother and leader of the band. And there's Mathieu on conga and trumpets. They all sing, as you're gonna hear. Uh, JB, what are you gonna play for us right now? We're gonna perform uh, Waweawa. Waweawa which means uh, you reap whatever you sow.
Our thanks to Music Time in Africa host Heather Maxwell for that fantastic music selection. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voafrica.com from all of us here in Washington. Have a great weekend. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America headquarters here in Washington. I am Shaka Sali. Straight Talk Africa. We call it like it is. We discuss issues that reflect the interests of our audience without fear or favor. We are guided by facts. And I look at myself as a servant of nothing but the truth.